Stanford University. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Shao. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, real-time analytics at Facebook. So uh, first of all, the agenda. So we'll go through first, what is uh, analytics and why do we need to go real-time? And then we'll go through a little bit details of our solutions. We have two systems. One is called Data Freeway, one is called Puma. And then eventually, we'll talk about the future works and the comparisons of some other systems in the industry. So uh, let's get started on the what and why. So first of all, um, the major product that uses the Facebook analytics. So it's called Facebook Insights. So basically, every website owners who put a like button from Facebook on their website, and every advertisers at Facebook, every application developers on Facebook, as well as the owners of Facebook pages, all those guys want to know about how many users are using their websites or they're seeing their ads uh, very quickly at every uh, period of time. And they also want to know the demographic breakdowns, which basically means what are the gender distribution, age distribution of the users. Um, also, they want to count the unique number of users, uh, as well as the heavy hitters, which basically means is the most, um, most popular URLs from a website or the most popular items in uh, applications, things like that. Um, so all these kind of are our use cases, and the major challenges with these problems are because of the scalability and latency. So we have huge amount of data. Those data come from both Facebook websites and non-Facebook websites. And uh, the users want to have low latency data presented to them. The reason is because for some news articles or for some um, applications, they want to know the result as soon as, uh, as soon as possible within like minutes instead of waiting for days. So um, we already had an analytic solution on top of Hadoop and Hive about uh, like one or two years ago. The basic flow of the data is like this. So we start from the left side, HTTP, the so web servers, which generate a like, huge amount of data and send to a uh, a uh, set of boxes called the uh, uh, running scribe daemon. So scribe is a log collection framework. After that, the data will get written into network file systems. All those processes are in seconds. And then after that, we will have hourly loaders and copiers, which gets the data into Hadoop and Hive. And then eventually, uh, we will compute the data summaries of that. So we have 3,000 uh, 3, nodes of Hadoop cluster, which pretty well solves the scalability problems already. And uh, the copy loader that we have is based on MapReduce. So that basically means if some of the processes fail, it will automatically get restarted. So we don't need to care about uh, machine failures, which is pretty good. And for the pipeline jobs, we have the Hive language, which, uh, which is basically a SQL-like langu uh, SQL language on top of MapReduce. So it is very easy for our Facebook engineers to use, and people are very happy mm -hmm. about it. However, there's a key problem about this pipeline. So the data delay is actually very long. Uh, the latency is usually like 24 to 48 hours, because when the data gets started at the daily pipeline jobs, it's already 24 hours past the data got generated. So that's a key problem that we want to solve. So in order to solve this problem, we thought about two different directions. The first direction is basically small batch processing. The second direction is called stream processing. Small batch processing is basically make a lot of very small MapReduce jobs. Instead of running a job every 24 hours, we run a job every hour, every 10 minutes, or every five minutes, and eventually can approximate the real-time requirement for our users. So the major challenges with that is the, the overhead of running a MapReduce job. Actually, it's pretty high. And in practice, we found running a MapReduce job every one minute is almost impractical, uh, is almost not practical on our cluster because our cluster is pretty big and the overhead can be very big. Submitting job can be something like um, um, 20 seconds or more. And uh, the other one, stream processing. So the basic idea is very simple. We aggregate the data as soon as the data arrived. Um, so the hard thing about that is uh, when we think about the scalability, when we think about hundreds of machines, 
how do we manage the machine failures? And those are the top challenges there. So eventually, um, the stream processing solutions wins because the reliability problems is actually not that hard to solve in the uh, reality. And um, we come up with a solution which contains the two components, the data freeway, which is a scalable data stream framework, and Puma, which is a reliable stream aggregation engine. So we will get into the details now into uh, data freeway first. So uh, in order to talk about data freeway, it's a good idea to go through the system that we had about one year earlier. It's called Scribe. So basically the idea is to have uh, near real-time real um, data streams uh, for our applications. So we still uh, start from the left side. The first hop uh, from like tens or hundreds of thousands of Scribe clients, which is the web servers, to hundreds of mid-tier. Uh, in this step, we basically reduce the number of TCP connections a lot by, by just uh, merging them together to fewer number of machines. The second hop from the mid-tier to the writer, the second hop here is uh, basically do the data shuffling. Um, so the log messages from the same category should go to the same destination so that it's easier for our user to access. The third step is very simple. The writers write the data to NFS. And then eventually, the consumers, there are two kinds of consumers. One is batch copy and loaders, which copies them to Hadoop. And then the other one is near real time uh, like applications using the uh, Unix tail and uh, fopen, very simple to open the data. So um, we basically, this is a very simple um, push, RPC-based uh, logging system. Every piece of data is get pushed into the next step. And it got open source in 2008. And uh, around that time, we have about 100 log categories at Facebook at that time. And when it got open source, it quickly get picked up by a lot of other internet companies. Um, and they use it uh, very, very pop It's po pretty popular around the world right now. Um, so the, the key feature and also the problem of this system is the routing of the data is actually static. So basically, for each of the nodes, internally we have a configuration, which is a routing table, which routes the data into the different locations. So this is pretty flexible, but it also creates a lot of problems for us, because uh, in order to scale the number of writers, we need to write a lot of configurations, and it's not easy to process. So the data view solution, we got it around the, um, like the middle of last year. And uh, we have been improving that for a pretty long time. So the basic idea of that is instead of manually managing the configurations, we use Zookeeper to, um, to distribute, uh, distribute those categories into the different uh, uh, writers. So currently, we handle about 9 gigabytes of second um, of throughput at peak with end-to-end -end latency less than 10 seconds. And we have about uh, 2,500 of categories. It's a pretty large scale. Um, so the key components of these systems, the first of all is uh, we merge the mid-tier writer and HDFS, like the NFS, into a single layer of components. So HDFS is much more scalable than NFS. Uh, Calligraphers is basically the Java version of the scribe. It contacts with Zookeeper to make sure it does not have a single point failure. And uh, the, uh, we also have some other commands related. We replace the batch copier with the continuous copier which basically co copies the data continuously to reduce the network jitters. Uh, we also have the p-tail, which is able to tell from HDFS, so that um, uh, it replaces the Unix command line tail components. So let's go into a little bit more details into each of the components here. So first of all, the calligraphers. So what calligraphers does is basically we get the data from RPC, get pu which gets pushed from the web tier, and then write that into, uh, into a file system. So uh, in the calligraphs world, each of the log category is uh, represented by uh, one or more file system directories. And each of the directory is basically <coughs> an ordered list of files. So I guess this is the simplest way of representing a data stream on a file system. So actually, there's no additional metadata. And we just use the file name to, um, to let us know like, when the data comes. And it is actually pretty good and very simple to use. Uh, the key feature of the calligraphers is the bucketing support. This is a key feature for the application side. So first of all, um, a lot of applications, when they have a lot of, uh, like a huge volume in a single data stream, they would like to bucket or uh, shard the applications 
based on some application defined metrics. For example, uh, based on user ID mod a number, or based on add ID mod some number. So that makes it easy for them to consume data in the future uh, using sharded service. We also support the infrastructure bucket, so which basically means uh, for a lot of streams from like several bytes per second to several gigabytes per second, we use exactly the same infrastructure to do that. So one directory, one file cannot be uh, cannot handle like gigabytes of throughput. So basically, we use multiple directories for that. But, but from the user's point of view, it's totally transparent. So in this way, we handle the scalability problem. Um, the performance of the system is really good. Uh, the latency uh, is basically determined by how frequently we do the file system sync. We do it every seven seconds right now. And we can easily get into three seconds or one second, depending on the efficiency of HDFS. The throughput is actually very high. We can easily saturate, uh, saturate the one gig bit of uh, NIC. And basically, um, that's about 100 megabytes per second. Uh, and in the future, we are planning to use the 10 gig NIC to make it even more, uh, even more performant. So the second component of the data freeway is uh, the conduce copier. So uh, the idea of the conduce copier is basically get the data from one file system, move to another file system. So the major difference between this one and the earlier um, like batch copier is we actually have very smooth network usage. So MapReduce job to copy the data is actually not that, um, I would say not that easy to manage. Because um, when MapReduce job starts, then it consumes a lot of the network bandwidth. When it stops, it does not use anything. So the continuous copy basically copies the file as it grows. So it's uh, much easier to use. So um, the deployment of a continuous copy, so continuous copy is basically a set of uh, individual tasks that uh, uh, basically are running as a map only job on Hadoop. So there's no communication, there's no direct communication between those tasks. Um, so as a result, it can be moved into any single, uh, any simple job scheduler out of the MapReduce framework. Um, so the key coordination layer inside the continuous copy is uh, using the log file right now. So basically make sure each of the continuous copy tasks does not compete for the different directories that it tries to copy. And we plan to move to Zookeeper very soon. So the last component in the data freeway is uh, called the p-tail. So the idea of the p-tail is basically uh, we want to allow tailing of the data from different directories at the same time. So these are three directories. Each of the directories right now have three files. The p-tail is tailing the different directories at the same time. So p-tail knows the location <coughs> of the file f offset in each of the directories. So uh, what it is used for is from the file system, we generate a data stream. And the data stream eventually can send back to RPR, uh, like the RPC if needed. Uh, the reliability of the PDL is guaranteed by using checkpoints. So basically, the checkpoint is uh, the name of the file as well as the file offset, file offset in each of the directories. We record all the file offsets together, and that is basically a checkpoint. With checkpoint, we can roll back to tail from any previous uh, place that we tailed before. So the good thing about that is uh, when we want to uh, do a checkpoint inside our application, we just write down the current PTL checkpoint, and uh, if the application crashes later, we just load the checkpoint again from some persistent storage, and we will be able to tell the data again without any loss or duplicates at all. So this is actually the power of uh, like pulling data from a file system. And for, for a lot of applications, we plan to move to this way so that we have better reliability. So we talked about several tools here. So I, I think it's a good idea to recap all the tools and see what are the differences there. Actually, in Data Freeway, we have two channels of data communication. One is basically push based on PRC. Another one is pull based on a file system. So the latency of the push is uh, much, uh, much, much shorter than uh, the file system because file systems, sometimes we need to have additional overhead get into disk or replications. Uh, for the loss, data loss and the data duplications, for the push and RPC, we, uh, we, we can potentially have a little bit of uh, data loss or data duplicate because there's no way to make uh, like a distributed checkpoint um, um, to like the source and the target of the system. But with the pooling semantics, it's much easier to do it. 
uh, the robust, robustness of the file system is higher. Um, so basically, if the network errors, we can easily recover. But if we do push, then let's say we send out some data, and the, the confirmation or the act got lost, then actually we will resend the data, which is not good. And the complexity of a file system is a little bit higher. Uh, even for Hadoop file system, it's actually not as stable as we want in our application. So we are continuing to improve that. And then all the four tools that we talk about here, it's basically uh, like creates a matrix around these two channels. So Scribe is uh, getting the data from RPC and sending it back to RPC. Calligrapher gets the data from RPC and sends to file system. Conduce Copier gets the data from file system back to file system. And the PTail plus another tool, which is uh, basically getting a data stream and write the data to RPC, uh, will, uh, will be the last circle, uh, will be the last arc in this circle. So basically, this is all about a data freeway, very simply, uh, because of limited time. Um, the second most important uh, component that we have is called the Puma. So it's a real-time aggregation engine uh, plus a storage. Um, so basically, uh, in order to talk about Puma, it's a good idea just to go through the uh, normal, like the backend systems, the architecture for a normal like aggregation engine. So basically, log stream get pushed into aggregation engines. And then aggregation engines do the aggregation either in memory or through some other ways. And then the data can be saved. The summaries can be saved to the storage. Uh, when we want to serve those summary data, the, uh, the serving can either directly come from the uh, aggregation engine, like this, or it can come from the storage. So um, in our use case, because of scale, we need to design our system very carefully. So first of all, we have one megabyte of log lines per second. Um, uh, this is write throughput, but the read throughput is actually pretty light because web website uh, website uh, administrators usually they seldomly actually look at the results uh, on the on the page. But we have a lot of them, so altern like altogether, it's a little bit higher still, but it's much lower than the uh, write throughput. So uh, we want to do multiple group bytes uh, per a single log entry. So for example, we want to group by age group by gender. So those are different operations we want to do at the same time. And also, um, the first key in the group by is always a time date related. So let's think about our advertisers. They want to see the number of clicks per uh, like minutes, per hour, or per day. So those are all date related. Actually, this is a key feature which allows us to optimize the system easier. And we also want to allow the complex aggregations which we talked about earlier, like unique user counters, as well as the most frequent elements. Those are memory, con uh, memory uh, aggressive um, applications. So um, first, let's start with the story engine. Story engine is that we start from uh, basically the MySQL and uh, edge based comparison. This is a very simple one page comparison. It's probably not um, a lot of uh, details, but basically edge based has a good support for distributed environment, because everything is automatic. We don't need to manage those machines. Well, for MySQL, we need to do the manual sharding and manual failover, things like that. Um, however, edge base also has its like, weak point. The read efficiency as, is actually a little bit lower because of the cache efficiency, like the memory efficiency um, in the Java, Java land. Uh, the write support is actually higher because edge base is kind of a uh, uh, it has a like a, a log transaction log, which makes it easy to write. Um, it also has a columnar support, which is uh, very useful in a lot of applications. So we decided to use EdgeBase for our application mainly because of the uh, management, like the lower management overhead. So the first application we did on top of that is actually a, a simple application called Puma2. Idea is very simple. We get the parallel data stream from Ptail. Uh, this is a set of machines, and these machines are actually symmetric of each other. So PTL is basically just for providing that data stream. Yeah. And uh, for each of the log line in the data stream, Puma2 will issue an increment operation to HBase. So HBase supports that increment operation, which is basically eventually implemented as a read and write inside HBase. But from the application point of view, it's a single operation. Uh, the Puma2 service is asymmetric. So there's no sharding. Actually, we can easily add more machines there. And um, then for edge base, uh, a single increment can actually 
be, uh, be applied on multiple columns, which is also a very nice feature. So uh, for those uh, demographic breakdowns, like group by age, group by gender, we do that actually in a single HBase instruction instead of multiple ones. Um, this architecture actually has its benefit and it also has its problems. So the benefit of the system is the Puma, 3, uh, Puma 2 code is very simple and it's very easy to maintain because there's no shard. Uh, we can bring up as many as machines that we need and we can turn them down and if machine fails, then it just fails. Uh, that's the good part of the system. The bad part of the system is uh, the increment operation in HBase is actually very expensive. So increment is implemented as a read and write in HBase. HBase is not very good for read, uh, read throughput. So we are seeing performance bottleneck there. Um, also, it cannot support complex aggregation because that potentially means we need to push a lot of stuff inside HBase, which is not easy to do. Um, so one complex aggregation called uh, like most frequent items, so basically is uh, the frequent URLs in our system, we implement that uh, very hacky. So basically we have multiple tables in HBase, one table for items that got viewed more than 10 times, one table for 100 times, one table for 1,000 times, and things like that. And we migrate items one by one whenever it crosses a boundary. Right? So that's a pretty hacky solution. Um, so it can cause small data duplicates as well, because the, uh, whenever we, the Puma sends the instruction to HBase, there's no way to verify, there's no way to know that it got succeeded or not, because the reply of the increment operation can get lost. And so we need to resend the, app, uh, resend the increment sometimes. Um, so because of those problems, we did some simple improvements. The first one is batching. It's a very simple idea. So we batch the, uh, batch the request from Puma2. And some of the log lines are very frequent so that we can batch the increment operations. Instead of increase by one every time, we increase by n. However, it is not working very well because we have a very long tail of uh, applications at our websites. As, uh, and also, batching actually uh, make it harder to make it real time because the batch can be, let's say if the batch is five minutes, then the data is delayed by five minutes. Then we have edge base uh, improvement. We have the increment operation, which optimize, uh, which basically we optimize those operations by reducing the locks inside the memory operation. Uh, we also uh, improve the edge base uh, efficiency by having the HBase region and the HDFF file collocated. Uh, so we also shortcut, uh, we also make, make a shortcut in the HBase process. So HBase, HBase process can directly uh, get the data from the file system instead of going through the HDFS demo. So because the file is already local. And also we have a lot of reliability improvements to make sure HBase works well under the high load. So, um, this actually made Puma 2 into production in March this year. But however, uh, we are still uh, not very happy with the performance, especially on the unique user and the uh, most frequent items. So that's why we come with the new architecture called Puma 3, which is right now uh, almost finished development and going to go all, uh, online very soon. So the major difference between Puma 2 and Puma 3 is we do all the aggregations inside the Puma's memory instead of using edge base. So, uh, first of all, in order to make that happen, Puma 3 has to be sharded by aggregation key. So the PTL data here is already sharded by the, let's say, the um, application ID or add ID when it gets into Puma 3. So each of the Puma process has a full picture of one aggregation, uh, for example, like for one advertiser or for one application. So each of the shard, uh, which is uh, basically each of the Puma 3 process, is basically um, hash table in memory. It's very simple. Um, the hash table has a, a, a key, which is the aggregation, uh, for example, like add ID. And uh, the value is uh, basically the user-defined aggregation function. It can be simple counters, it can be some, it can be something more complicated, uh, like unique users, things like that. And uh, HBase is used for the persistent key value storage. So we just store the data into HBase, but we usually do, do not need to read from HBase. So we will see some details soon. Um, first operation, write workflow, right here. From PTO to Puma 3. For each of the log line, we extract the columns for the keys and values that we want to aggregate. So we look, at, uh, look up in the hash map by the key, and we call the user-defined aggregation by passing the value around. Uh, that's very simple. 
the checkpoint workflow. So in order to make sure Puma 3 um, does not, uh, in order to make sure the application still works when a single process dies, then we checkpoint the data every five minutes into HBase. So we basically modify, uh, save all the modified hash table entries plus the PTL checkpoints, like position in PTL stream, all to the HBase storage. Uh, on startup, when there, there's a, a node failure, then for example, like a Puma 3 fail, then we need to load the data from HBase. So this read is actually a sequential read because we scan all the data, so it's actually pretty efficient. Um, so the last one is uh, basically the, um, I think uh, the, the checkpoint is uh, uh, for some of the old data, for example, yesterday's aggregation routes. It's never going to be changed again. So we just store that in HBase and get rid of that from the memory, so to save memory. Um, so the read workflow, for the read workflow, we mainly serve the data from memory if user decides to read uncommitted data. So uh, in that case, it's really efficient. We get the data with seconds of delay. Um, but there's uh, one caveat of that. So if the Puma 3 process dies and it gets start up again and load the checkpoint, the data, the, the summary numbers can potentially decrease. So in order to avoid that, we plan to add a cache layer between the Puma 3 and the readers to make sure the number does not decrease because that's unexpected for our advertisers or applications. So we can also read committed data, which means basically we just read the data from edge base through Puma 3. Um, so for those data that are more than one day ago, which has stopped growing, so we always store that in edge base, so it's always committed data. The Puma 3 also supports some simple joins. Simple join is basically uh, we do a static join. Uh, we, we store a static table in HBase. So when the Puma 3 is uh, uh, processing the log line, we do a lookup inside HBase, get the value, and then use that value as just one of the columns in the log line. Uh, we found local cache in the, each of the Puma 3 process actually improves the throughput of the, uh, of the UDF, the user defined function a lot. And um, by comparing these two systems, uh, Puma 3 is actually much better in the throughput. With Puma 2, we use 100 nodes to process about uh, 600,000 uh, 600, log lines uh, per second. And with Puma 3, we saved 75% of machines. Uh, we only use 25 machines to do the same workload. And we found HBase is really good at write throughput. Basically, uh, we can write as fast as we can usually, uh, although the read has a problem. So, uh, but because of that, our Puma 3 application uh, just uses the most big advantage of HBase, which is, I think, a very good um, experience that we learned from using HBase. So Puma 3, the problem is it needs a lot of memory. As you guys see, it's an in-memory hash table. So we use 60 gigabytes of memory per box for the hash map. And in order to scale that up, we are thinking about in the future using SSD, uh, which can be like 600 gigabytes per per box, which we think is probably good enough uh, to scale the service up. Um, so Puma 3 uh, allows the spatial aggregations, which does, uh, was not supported in Puma 2. So for the unique user counters, we plan to, uh, we already have the adaptive sampling, which basically have uh, at most 8,000 user IDs in memory, but we do sampling when the user ID, uh, uh, like fill up, the, fill up the, uh, that uh, buffer. And we also plan to have a Bloom filter, which are standard technology to approximate the unique counters. So uh, by the way, all the, those spatial aggregations are approximate because we want to save memory. For most of frequent items, we have the classic lossy counting algorithm from that uh, randomized algorithm book. And also there were some recent uh, improvements of the algorithm. There's a probabilistic uh, lossy counting algorithm which uh, got published in, I think, last year or the year before last year, and we plan to use that. So, then the last key thing of the Puma compared with a lot of our system is the, the language. So you guys uh, know like at Facebook we build the Hive on top of MapReduce, so this is very similar. So basically we have a SQL-like lang SQL language to define the input stream, like define columns, and it, we can define views on top of that with a filter which supports user-defined functions. So UDF.h here is a, just, is a remote lookup. And we can create a edge based table and create a logical table, which is on top of edge based table for storing the aggregation results. And then um, the query itself is uh, basically simple SQL. So select a bunch of columns from a table and group by a bunch of columns. 
So note the first column here has to be time related so that we can flash out those old entries to save memory. So that concludes the Puma side. Uh, so for future works, very briefly, because of time, let's go through that. Um, so the first thing, scheduler support. So we don't have scheduler support right now. Basically, it means we manually run the uh, Puma 3 process on different machines. But this is a very simple scheduling problem because the job is continuous. We don't need a very complex, uh, a complex algorithm like a MapReduce fair scheduler or whatever. So we can do it very simply uh, by just running some jobs on some machines. Um, so the second step after that will be mass adoption. We plan to move a lot of the batch processing pipelines into real time because real time is actually more efficient as well as provide better guarantees. The third step is the uh, open source. So we have the uh, biggest bottleneck, uh, which is the Java Swift uh, dependency right now, and we will open source them by one by one. So calligraphers will be the first one, will probably be next month or the month after next. So um, I guess I will probably skip this. We have a lot of systems in, in the industry which are similar. But instead of comparing them, uh, the summaries of our system, the key features, scalable data streams, and support both push and RPC. And um, uh, those are basically the key features of the data freeway compared with other systems. And the Puma stuff is, uh, we have very good support for the time-based aggregations. And we have a query language, which is, uh, I think, is missing from a lot of other components in the industry. Uh, but we don't have the support for the sliding window and the stream joins, which are the focus of the academic research, uh, like the Stanford Stream project. Uh, for hardware, uh, for tolerance, there are several components. The first one is uh, like a data with freeware components, the zookeeper coordination uh, of uh, calligraphers. So zookeeper writers use uh, uh, zookeeper, so, so basically the calligraphers writers use zookeeper to coordinate. So what it does is uh, basically in zookeeper, we uh, put a lot of tasks. Then the writers will do lead election for those tasks. Uh, for each of the writer, it only knows the local picture. It does not know the global picture, but it will uh, release the buckets, release those tasks, or add additional tasks whenever it was able to take more load. And if the writer dies, then Zookeeper will automatically expire the claim of the task from the writer. We use that uh, uh, if, if, ephemeral, uh, ephemeral node inside the Zookeeper, which has that capability. So for Puma 2, actually, it's a stateless service. So there's no problem with the hardware failure. For Puma 3, uh, the checkpoint is inside the HBase. So as long as the HBase is stable, which it is, then we won't be able to carry, uh, we won't need to worry about that um, hardware failure problem. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.